Um, thank you so much, Sarah, to you and, and to your school um, and your staff and your colleagues for all that you've done to support me and, and my family and, and our friends as we continue to keep the memory of my father alive through this award and through the incredible journalists that we get to highlight and spotlight every year. Um, and not only has this partnership really brought our award to the next level, but we also want to thank um, Reporters Without Borders who were there in the first few critical days and months and years of this award and have been terrific partners for us, helping us, you know, identify the journalists that, that deserve this award, that are working far away from the spotlight and the work that they do is so crucial to supporting a free press and access to information around the world. So before, um, before introducing the award, I wanted to induce, uh, introduce Daphne Pellegrino from Reporters Without Borders to say a few words. Thanks, Camille. Hi, everyone. My name is Daphne, and I'm Reporters Without Borders Advocacy Manager in the United States. Reporters Without Borders, for those who aren't familiar with our work, uh, is an international organization that defends press freedom uh, and the safety of journalists. We're headquartered in Paris, but we have offices worldwide, and we've partnered with the Peter Mackler Ward for many years now, and I'm really proud of representing reporters of that board at Paris Sony. Um, journalists have gradually declined in recent years to rank 142nd in Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index, which ranks the uh, levels of press freedom in 180 countries across the globe. As a female journalist working in Kashmir, Masrat has experienced some of the threats to press freedom firsthand. Uh, uh, facing police intimidation and accusations of fake news and disturbing law and order as a consequence of her work. But if brave reporting is a disturbance, then Masrat must be getting into the type of trouble that the late U.S. Congressman and civil rights leader John Lewis would call good trouble, necessary trouble. And we're so grateful, grateful to her for be doing that good and necessary work. I'd like to thank CUNY Newmark School of Journalism for putting on such a powerful event every year, the Peter Mackler Awards for their tireless commitment to honoring the work of brave and talented journalists and Masrat for her extraordinary courage in journalism. Thanks. Thank you, Daphne. Um, and now it is my complete privilege to introduce Masrat, our winner of this year's Peter Mackler Award. Our family, myself, my mother, my sister, are honored and privileged, Masrat, to offer you this award for your courage in journalism in the name of my father, Peter Mackler. Every year when our partners, Reporters Without Borders, shares with us a list of the deserving journalists that they believe should receive this award, it's so hard to pick just one person out of the list of outstanding individuals who do such critical work and, um, and work tirelessly in their countries to report the truth every single day. But this year you stood out for us because of everything in what you do, in what you say, just reminded us of my father. You have the same passion, the same dedication, the same drive to bear witness that he had. And he would have been so proud of you. He would have taken you under his wing and he would have wanted to transmit all his knowledge and all his long experience of reporting in war zones he covered wars in Serbia and Iraq and Afghanistan, and he knew a lot of the pressures that you are experiencing in Kashmir. And he would have also appreciated all of the extra hurdles that you face as a Muslim woman. We were deeply moved by your photographs documenting women in your country, women behind veils, women pushed back as if they're unimportant, women who nevertheless fiercely argue with soldiers, women who keep their dignity and face danger up front. And we hope that this award will send a message that your work matters. It matters a great deal. That your dedication and your professionalism is a gift to all of us and that it needs to be protected and not threatened. And whenever we give this award, we like to tell our winners that it's more than an award, is joining a family of courageous reporters. Before you, we've honored women who fought similar fights um, against bigotry and har harassment like Asma Shirazi in Pakistan, Zaina Arhaim in, Sy in Syria. We've honored men like Marcos Vizcarra in Mexico and Lukpan Akhmedyarov in Kazakhstan who steadfastly kept reporting without regard for their own safety. And some of them have paid a very high personal price, but they've never given up. 
They've all kept at it. And in the end, they've always prevailed. And I also would be remiss if I didn't mention Faisal Sali, who received the prize in 2013 and is now the Minister of Information for the Democratic Government of Sudan, contributing his passion for fairness and transparency to that fragile nation and giving us all hope. So on behalf of me, my mom, my sister, all of our friends and supporters, and all of the past winners, welcome to our family. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Kamali. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Masra Zahra, and I'm an independent photojournalist based in Kashmir. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be the recipient of this year's Peter Mackler Award for ethical and courageous journalism. Uh, the recognition this award gives to me, uh, to my work, is extremely gratifying, as the values of this award stands uh, are resonate with me on a personal level. Uh, the ideas of truth, fairness, and accuracy are something that I strive to achieve through my work. Um, I appreciate the award special nod to those who continue to work uh, and uh, to bring out the stories uh, under exceptional circumstances. Coming from the Kashmir uh, where the working conditions of uh, journalists and media persons have become extremely uh, and increasingly hostile due to the state scrutiny. Uh, this achievement and this award is not for just uh, for not for myself, but for the everyone uh, whose main incentive is to work uh, in this in this field. Whose main incentive to work in this field is to bring out the truth uh, through their work. Uh, come, I, I was born and raised in the Srinagar's uh, old town, a place that has witnessed the violence of uh, incidents of violence over the past few decades. Um, I grew up witnessing the first hand devastating consequences of conflict. Um, and consequently, I uh, came across a journalist roaming uh, on the streets with their cameras uh, hung over their shoulders. Uh, following the protest march and covering the uh, realities of the world where I live in, uh, I would often imagine myself in that role, uh, uh, capturing pictures and documenting events. Um, uh, my, uh, uh, despite of all the odds, I continue. I uh, joined the journalism school in Kashmir, the Central University of Kashmir, where I uh, uh, joined uh, the course of journalism and uh, I uh, started working as a photojournalist back in 2016. And uh, sub subsequently, uh, constantly, I, uh, right after I started my degree, in the early uh, our, in the early days of my uh, career, I realized that there is a lack of young Kashmiri women in the field of photojournalism. From my personal view, uh, I believe that it happens because of the uh, Kashmiri society that uh, discourages women and, in certain cases, bars women from undertaking the roles which bring them in public sphere. Uh, in a in a militarized zone uh, like Kashmir, where there is a constant threat on, uh, where is, there is a constant crackdown on dissent and a threat to press freedom. One has to navigate uh, with a sense of uh, unpredict unpredictability and uh, anxiety. And this anxiety doubles uh, and multiplies uh, for me uh, because being a Muslim and being a, a female, so uh, my, uh, I had an opportunity to, de to develop an understanding to how to operate within the hostile environments of Kashmir. Uh, I have learned from uh, the people around me to uh, keep a calm head over my shoulders. My identity as a Kashmiri and a woman informs my approach uh, on to how, to, uh, how to operate uh, in a hostile environment. Working as a photojournalist in one of the most difficult regions in the world, I have worked 
uh, with the women and uh, children in Kashmir to bring out their uh, voices. Uh, my pictures offers uh, a glimpse of the everyday struggle of Kashmiri people. Uh, the lives of Kashmiri people are uh, endlessly militarized and uh, the, this happens because of the political turmoil and it has affected every aspect of people's lives and everyone is struggling. Even the women and children are more struggling in Kashmir. So I, uh, for me, I want to, uh, it's important for me to uh, position myself uh, to my, my work from a perspective of solidarity and empathy so that it gives a uh, voice to, the, to those uh, silenced and un, uh, victims of this unabated conflict. I therefore extend my gratitude to the Mackler family uh, who have chosen me and uh, for this award. And I'm deeply uh, honored to, to join the list of esteemed uh, awardees who have worked in uh, extraordinary and who have made mark in the field of journalism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mazrat, for that very moving speech and, and for the work that you do. Um, we're going to move now into the panel section of the event, and I want to introduce Farwa Amr, who is the director of the South Asia program at the East West Institute, and who has a great deal of experience focusing on the regional issues uh, there, and has work and is working with a, a terrific panel this morning. So I'm going to allow uh, her next to step up to the mic and take it from here. Thank you so much, Sarah, and congratulations, Masrat, very well deserved. Um, again, as Sarah introduced, I'm Farva Amir, and I'm the Director for South Asia Program at the East West Institute. Hello and welcome everyone once again to this morning's panel discussion on the freedom of speech, journalism, and conflict, the road ahead for Kashmir. Kashmir has been a flashpoint in South Asia's regional dynamics for decades now. Um, this uh, Kashmir nestled between two nuclear armed neighbors, India and Pakistan. This, picturesque, um, this picturesque uh, disputed territory has been a cause of conflict and a continuous contention for multiple reasons, whether it's geopolitical, military, or ethnic issues. And as Masrat's work demonstrates, the life uh, within the disputed territory is not easy, particularly for the women community, for the journalists, and for other members of the local community. But to further shed light on this, we have with us a dynamic set of experts, starting with Mohammed Junaid, who's an assistant professor of anthropology at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. He has a PhD from the Graduate Center CUNY with research on violence, youth activists, and political subjectivity in Kashmir. Also joining us is Deepthi Misri, who's an associate professor of women and gender studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's a literary and cultural critique with her work focusing on questions of gender, violence, and representation. She's also a founding member of Critical Kashmir Studies Collective. Last but not the least, we have with us Suchitra Vijayan, who's a barrister at law, researcher, and author. She's also the founder and executive director of the Polis Project. So thank you all for your time and welcome once again. This is going to be an exciting conversation, but before we begin, some housekeeping notes for a terrific audience in attendance today. Uh, so our session will run for about an hour. And if you have any questions, please feel free to use your chat function to send them over and I'll be able to bring those questions up in the last 15 minutes of our panel discussion today. So without further ado, I'm going to kick off the conversation with you, Janae. Janae, you grew up in Kashmir. Yes. Yes, I did. Hi. Uh, so, Jimmy, you, you, you grew up in Kashmir. Is there an echo? Sorry. Uh, sorry. I can hear you well. Okay, perfect. Um, so, you grew up in Kashmir, so I'm, your work has extensively focused on military subjects. I feel like there's an echo coming back. I'm just going to mute my mic until you finish your question. There's an echo. Oh. Okay. Is this better now? Can everyone hear me well? 
Okay, perfect, perfect. So I'm going to continue. Um, Junaid, again, we're going to kick off the conversation with you. Uh, you grew up in Kashmir, and your work has extensively researched on issues of military occupation and political subjectivity in Kashmir since the last 1980s. So it would be great if you could shed some light on the history of the Kashmiri conflict. How did we get here? How did the crisis manifest itself over the years into the situation that we are witnessing today? So I'm going to turn over to you now, Janet. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Craig Newar Newmark, Graduate School of Journalism, Farva, and others uh, who have invited me. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I want to congratulate, first of all, uh, Masrat Zehra, uh, fellow Kashmiri, for her superb achievement. Um, her work has been an inspiration for uh, us, other Kashmiris who are working elsewhere in the world in different fields. Um, so thank you. Um, well, as you pointed out, uh, at the beginning of your comments, uh, Kashmir, the question of Kashmir has been overdetermined by this idea that it's a territorial dispute between India and Pakistan. Um, in fact, uh, most of the world understands Kashmir primarily through this lens of being a bilateral dispute. Um, and as, as some of you probably know, uh, some of the earliest resolutions um, of the United Nations Security Council were about Kashmir, which uh, had at that in 1948 called for a ceasefire and a plebiscite and demilitarization of Kashmir. Of course, none of that has uh, taken place. Uh, but uh, what is important to understand is that Kashmir has its own history. It's, it has uh, a history of its own continuity, uh, a long um, sense of original identity. And Kashmiri people, uh, before 1947, when the British left and India and Pakistan were born, uh, Kashmiris had been uh, struggling for freedom and independence and, and dignity and many other issues that people um, are, have been struggling for all over the world. Um, so 1947, when the partition uh, took place uh, and India and Pakistan were born, both the countries laid claims, uh, territorial claims on Kashmir. Uh, Pakistan's claim was based on the idea that Kashmir had a Muslim majority. So according to the partition plan, uh, um, Kashmir should be part of Pakistan. Indian uh, claim was primarily based on the idea that the ruler of the country, ruler of Kashmir at that time, a Hindu ruler, who was ruling over a Muslim majority uh, nation uh, had signed at what is called the Treaty of Accession uh, with India. So the Indian claim is based on the idea that since he signed off Kashmir to India, uh, Kashmir is uh, India's. Um, now, uh, this narrative, this story that is uh, often told um, is incomplete and it raises Kashmir's own um, struggle, its own internal dynamics, its own as people's aspirations. Uh, um, Kashmir before 1947 was already struggling to liberate itself from this um, Dogra dynasty, the, the ruling dynasty of Kashmir. Um, they did not have any legitimacy in Kashmir. Um, they were ruling Kashmir as a feudal autocracy. Um, and um, they had spent pro uh, 100 years since 1846. I don't want to go back all the way to 1846, but um, for 100 years, they had ruled Kashmir as a, a feudal uh, fiefdom. And so their rule had no consensus from the, the ruled. Um, and uh, Kashmiris, uh, after 1947, questioned uh, the ability of the ruler to sign themselves them off and their country off to India. And that's the root of the um, problem in Kashmir, that uh, what the ruling class has wanted in Kashmir is not the same as what the majority of the people in Kashmir have wanted. Um, over the last 70 years, um, Kash uh, Kashmir um, became a military occupation progressively. India, in, uh, in, in effect, invaded Kashmir in 1947 and annexed it based on this uh, instr instrument of accession. And since then, it used um, different kind of machinations, electoral malfeasance, rigging, arresting um, opponents, um, and outright you know, uh, assaults on people, massacres, to subdue the population. This um, continued till 1990 when Kashmiris rose up in a mass uh, rebellion. 
Um, it was, uh, it started off with mass protests in places like Srinagar, in South Kashmir, North Kashmir. And then um, when the military repression um, intensified, it turned into, uh, into an armed struggle, which continued into 90s and um, India used, you know, classic counterinsurgency tactics um, from 1990 onwards, um, using uh, policies such as uh, scorched earth, catch and kill, um, arresting and uh, eliminating any kind of uh, opposition in Kashmir. And by the end of that decade, from 1990 to 2000, there were more than 60,000 people dead in Kashmir. And um, Kashmir had become uh, a place which felt like a uh, you know, silent graveyard, although the aspirations of people hadn't um, you know, been diminished or uh, subdued, but the political resistance, resistance had been uh, crushed to a large extent. And it's in this era, in the post-2000 era, when um, many Kashmiris uh, who had um, until then been silenced started to, uh, you know, take to fields like journalism, become, uh, go for higher studies, uh, become writers, novelists, artists, musicians. And in the, the 2000s, from 2000 to 10, um, is a time when um, Kashmiri resistance took on this a different form uh, of expressing themselves to the world. English is not our first language. You know, we were not directly uh, colonized by the British. We were sold by the British in 1846 to this uh, Dogras, but they didn't control us directly. So we didn't have a colonial legacy. Uh, but Kashmiris began to write, <coughs> uh, articulate themselves in English, um, primarily trying to speak to the rest of the world to uh, express what was going on in Kashmir. Um, from 2008 onwards, um, there were protests again in Kashmir um, because the Indian government was uh, attempting to make um, demographic changes uh, uh, all across the region and which provoked a lot of response from Kashmiris. Um, and these protests were uh, brutally crushed um, from 2008, nine and 10. There were uh, stories uh, upon stories about how young men and women in Kashmir were being um, blinded by pellet guns. Um, thousands upon thousands were uh, permanently um, maimed. Uh, hundreds more young people were um, killed. And um, there's literally no one in Kashmir right now who, can, uh, who does not have someone in their immediate family or extended family who has not gone through torture. Um, and uh, or someone who is not been through the prison system that India has put in place in, in the region. Um, this has continued and in 2016 there were um, Mohammed, we can't hear you. Something happened to your mic. Can you try connect your audio again? We still can't hear you. I mean, we can we can come back to you. Uh, um, is that okay? Oh wait, did your audio disconnect? Can you hear? Are you able to hear me now? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know when you stopped uh, hearing me, but um, I'll just go back to 2016. Um, and so in. In 2016, these protests intensified again and Indian government uh, started this new wave of repression in Kashmir. And uh, for many of you probably know that this is the time when Modi came to, had come to power already in India and Indian government's policies in Kashmir um, took on a, um, the, in the intensity of repression took on a higher scale, higher pitch. And um, not only were um, Kashmiri militants attacked, but the civil society members were arrested. Um, the Kashmiri intellectuals were harassed. Um, Kashmiris who were expressing themselves on social media platforms were uh, targeted, arrested, um, threatened, intimidated. Um, and this has continued uh, 
until last year in 2000, in uh, 2019, when on August 5th, uh, Indian parliament uh, basically formally annexed Kashmir. Well, in Kashmir had been annexed by India in 1947. There, there were some uh, constitution, constitutional elements in place that had preserved some degree of Kashmiri autonomy. Um, you know, for us um, uh, who have done historical anthropological work in the region, we know very well that those, that autonomy was already an empty shell. It was only a symbolic uh, autonomy. Uh, but on August 5th, 2019, Indian government took even that away. But the most critical aspect uh, of the August 5, 2019 decision was to remove uh, what is called the Article 35A, which had prevented uh, people from India to come and uh, own land in Kashmir. Um, this removal of this article opened the floodgates um, of, you know, um, in, in Kashmir. In effect, Kashmir was turned from a military occupation into a settler colonial uh, region. Um, this process has gone on in, since last year. India has, uh, every law that India has passed in Kashmir has been to aid the settler colonial occupation now. Um, from, um, you know, changing environmental protection laws uh, to changing uh, domicile laws. Um, what it, what Indian government has done is deny uh, every capacity that Kashmiris had to determine who could be a citizen of Kashmir and to impose their own uh, citizenship laws um, in, 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 in the region. So um, we are right now in a Kashmir is in great despair. Uh, people have been focused on um, lack of 4G internet. Of course, you know, um, some of us have been um, recently, um, I mean, I'm speaking to you from Western Massachusetts right now, um, but uh, since the lockdown because of the pandemic, we have all seen how difficult it can be to give our children online education, to like, you know, do things online. Uh, in Kashmir, um, for the last one year, and even before that, um, there has been uh, in no internet, or even when internet is on, it's at speeds that you can't totally you cannot function. Um, but since we have we have been focused on um, these um, issues of 4G and whatnot, uh, there's a larger picture that is being missed, uh, and that picture is of how India is uh, continuing apace with its project of settler colonialism. And it's in this context where, um, and I will probably end with that, um, where uh, Kashmiri voices become so important and why um, Indian government is so critical and comes down so hard on um, Kashmiri journalists, writers, or anybody who's writing on the social media. It's not a surprise to me, for instance, that Masrat uh, was called in for questioning by the police, or there are a number of other journalists who have been going through this um, harassment over the last year, and even before. There's one journalist, um, Asif Sultan, who has been in uh, prison for two years uh, because he didn't reveal the source of his um, uh, reportage. Um, and people have been assaulted. Photojournalists, of course, are at the forefront of all of this because they are there uh, covering what is happening on the streets. Um, the primarily, uh, what India wants is for the world to forget Kashmir for, uh, and to create conditions within Kashmir where Kashmiris despair so much that we don't speak at all, that we just accept fate accompli, which is basically um, end of our survival as a, as a community, as a people. Um, so, um, this is a critical stage in Kashmir um, and already Indian government has um, issued domicile certificates to uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are not Kashmiris or who are not, you know, the original residents of the, the state. Um, um, and soon the envir environmental laws have been changed. Um, they, they're soon going to get the lands, um, take over lands, state lands. And an army already has close to 750,000 soldiers in Kashmir. They occupy the best lands already. I mean, um, and so it will be very easy for India to completely change the face of Kashmir uh, through this um, demographic, forcible demographic change. Um, yeah, so I'll just end by saying congratulations again to Masrat for continuing your courageous work. Um, and I hope you continue to do so. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Vinod, for taking us back into uh, the history of the conflict. It's uh, very important for the audience to understand why we are where we are in the disputed territory. But I want to give Deepthi and Suchitra um, also a chance if they want to weigh in on this, uh, on the history of the conflict. If you have any comments, if you can briefly share them with us, uh, that'll be great as well. I think I'll just add very quickly that um, the abrogation of um, of Article 370 that Janine just talked about, and Janine, thank you for the context, was also um, made on grounds of uh, of gender equality, um, and so you know that is something that also uh, we need to be attentive to is the way in which settler colonial projects will often uh, make settler colonial moves um, in the name of feminism. Um, and so, you know, in the interest of time, I'll just keep it there. I think readers can sort of research some of this for themselves. But the argument was that um, that, that Kashmiri women will be better served um, uh, in terms of their access to permanent residency in Kashmir uh, if um, Article 370 is taken out. Um, that, I think it's an excellent thread into our next question, which is to you, Deepthi which is basically based on your expertise, on your work. And you maintain the great focus on women-centered experiences in conflict-prone regions. So it'd be interesting to hear from you on how do you look at women uh, and their role that they're playing or can play in any human rights movement in Kashmir. I mean, in Masjid, we have a prime example of somebody who's braved the political and security climate to bring the perspectives of women to the fore. Uh, but the community largely remains oppressed. So what are your thoughts on any real opportunities for women empowerment or women participation in raising the voice of Kashmiris? And if there's any scope at all for international community to facilitate the cause? So over to you now, Deepi. Thanks, Flavra. Um, so I guess I have a few things to, sh to say and maybe I'll show some images while doing it. Um, because it's useful to think about uh, Masrat's uh, photography and her image making in light of a larger visual landscape around Kashmir. Um, and so, you know, to the point about women's oppression in Kashmir, you know, I want to just begin by saying it is true that women remain largely oppressed in Kashmir as they do uh, anywhere else, as they do in India, for example, as they do in the United States. Um, but they're not only oppressed, they're also agents, they're political agents. Um, and that, I think, is, is one of the things that is most striking about um, the selection of um, photographs that Masrat has um, sent for the Mackler Award, um, is they feature women in gestures of confrontation and political agency in, in political community with each other. And so that, I think, is very important. So, for example, if I can just share my screen, because I think it's worth going back to look at some of these images. Um, let me see if it allows me to do that. Yeah. So if I can just share my screen, um, you can see this image um, where we see a woman protester who has applied salt to her face in order to protect herself from tear gas. Um, you know, here again, I think in all of these images we see women often in sort of like confrontational gestures and here even a young girl like a school child kind of staring down um, an Indian soldier. Um, I want to also you know dwell upon on, on this um, striking photograph because um, you know Masrat also frequently captures women in her photographs in these kind of confrontational modes um, who are often stereotyped as, as being oppressed right so veiled uh, sort of like the burqa clad a uh, Kashmiri Muslim woman is often produced as a kind of sort of like uniform victim um, who needs to be saved by um, Indian modernity in the form of um, settler colonialism. But as we can see here, you know, in this sort of like, you know, in this really sort of angry confrontation, we can see those very women being presented as political agents. And I think that's very, very important for us to, um, you know, underscore. And just in, in, in light of like the larger context in which, um, you know, the larger visual landscape I was talking about around how Kashmiri women are often represented. Um, you know, this is a story from a couple of years ago where a young um, Kashmiri actress in, in the Bollywood industry was um, kind of um, compared by an Indian sports minister um, 
to um, a woman in a cage, for example. So he was standing in front of this painting where, as you can see in this, in this painting right here, there's an equation between a woman who's sort of like, you know, cowering in a, in a cage and a burqa clad woman. So that's the equation is that, you know, a burqa clad woman is the equivalent of somebody who has been caged. And in um, the context of sort of uh, commenting on this, um, he invoked this, um, this Bollywood actress, Daira Basim, and she, of course, sort of like responded very curtly, but this is the larger landscape. This is the way in which burqa clad women are sort of broadly tend to be represented. And you can see a very different image here, of course. So I just want to sort of point to what, what Masrat's image making is kind of pushing um, against. Um, and, you know, I also, of course, it's, it, it bears saying that women are um, not only oppressed by local patriarchy, which is the, you know, which is the kind of women's oppression that is often, probably most often outside of Kashmir, uh, sort of spoken of when we talk about women's um, oppression, but they are um, oppressed by the state. They experience the direct and indirect violence of the state. Um, and so I, you know, I want to mention, for example, um, just last week, um, Kausar Riaz, a 45-year-old Kashmiri woman who was a baker, uh, was shot by multiple bullets, which killed her on the way to baking bread. Um, and so just on the way to work, she was um, killed. Um, her son said, you know, at the time that they buried her, her body wouldn't stop bleeding even in the grave. They had to wrap her body in polythene uh, in, in order to control um, the bleeding. Um, and so that is also, you know, I would argue that that is also, we should understand that as women's oppression as well. So Kashmiri women's oppression should not be visible as women's oppression uh, only when it is at the hands of Kashmiri men. Um, but we also need to understand, um, you know, this kind of settler colonial violence against women, um, th that women are subject to the same kind of violence that all Kashmiris are in, in, in Kashmir. And so that is also something that I think Masrat's photographs, um, you know, remind us. Um, in terms of the role that women can play um, around human rights, um, I can stop sharing right here. Um, in terms of the role that women can play in, in, you know, towards human rights in Kashmir, I think, you know, Kashmiri women have been playing that role um, in, in the movement for self-determination in Kashmir for, for decades, right? So from protesting in the streets to, you know, social media activism, to producing art, to even throwing stones um, against Indian sort of army personnel, um, they have been active in all of these ways. Um, you know, they have protested um, during the Dogra regime that um, Junaid was talking about. Kashmiri women have um, of, of a lower class have been on the streets. And, you know, it's often the case that um, the sort of forerunners of Kashmiri feminism are um, sort of like uh, women affiliated with state power are often seen as the sort of uh, feminist pioneers. But we also need to, you know, Kashmiri feminist scholars have asked us to think about, um, you know, these women who have been protesting for a very long time um, against a colonial occupation um, as, as, as feminist activists um, as well. And so I think, we, you know, we just, I think Masrat's work asks us to broaden our understanding of like, you know, of, of what feminist protest, feminist activism or women's activism can sort of consist of um, in Kashmir. And so, you know, lastly, I'll just sort of mention a, a couple of um, the larger visual landscape again, right? So in Kashmir, I think we have um, activists like, um, like um, the women of the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons, for example, who stage uh, a public protest in a park in Srinagar every month. And, um, you know, we can think of them as also um, recognizing there's an interesting continuity between their work and between Masrat's work, because they too understand the power of the visual in commanding um, attention to the issues that they've been talking about. In that case, the, the instance of enforced disappearance um, of young, mostly um, Kashmiri men uh, by the state. So they understand the power of the visual. I understand them as visual activists as well. And so Masrat is sort of like, you know, um, sort of working in, in that tradition and in, in good company. There are also now young women photographers who are coming up uh, sort of alongside Masrat, uh, you know, a, a cohort of young women like Sana Irshad Mattu, like Durdana Bhatt, who are um, part of this larger cohort of women who are using photography to foreground everyday life in occupied Kashmir. And so I hope that this honor to Masrat will drive more attention to this, um, you know, the visual production and the visual agency 
um, of Kashmiri women activists, artists, photojournalists um, in general. I, I, I certainly think that that is the hope. So Matsrat, congratulations again. Thanks for you know, giving us a chance to look again at this wonderful work and um, for all you do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepthi, for celebrating the work of Masrat along with us. Uh, there were some truly moving images that you shared, and uh, thank you so much for your reflections on uh, how women are facing daily lives under oppression. I just want to give Junaid and Suchitra an opportunity also to share their perspectives on uh, women oppression in Kashmir, if they have any comments uh, to share with our audience. Um, I uh, just wanted, to, again, thank um i just want to celebrate and congratulate masrat and i think it's just we talk about courage and resilience but also just a celebration of masrat and her work but um i just kind of um had a, a quick follow-up to what Deepthi said is that um the visual landscape in kashmir is very specific in which uh, no else nowhere else does the state spend so so much time to control the narrative, which means that Kashmiri photographers play an incredibly important role um, in not only documenting what's happening to them, but also in terms of creating uh, an archive um, of self that is important. Um, again, um, Deepthi herself, in writing about um, the APDP, um, has previously written that you know a photograph can also act like a kind of a proof in the face of state denial. And I think this photograph is always in Kashmir, given how much is censored, I think we really have to kind of think about the image in terms of creating a selfhood, because the first thing to get eroded is the self under militarization. Thank you, Suchitra. Junaid, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, um, you know, photographs have this potential to stir the established archive. Um, Kashmir has historically been represented as this paradise and Indian photo uh, photographers, European photographers have typically used um, um, Kashmir as a background to uh, or turn their lenses upwards towards the mountains and beautiful peaks. And it's the works of uh, people like Masrat and others who are like turning their lenses towards ordinary people, the people who inhabit the so-called paradise. Um, and stir the this this archive and tell the world that you know this is not Kashmir is not just that um, peaks and the beautiful uh, valleys it's also ordinary peoples and, and their daily lives and I think that um, this award kind of uh, celebrates that vision as well it's like us uh, speaking back or um, turning the camera back on that colonial lens. Thank you so much, Junaid. So before I turn over to the next question, I just want to remind everyone in attendance today, please use the chat function if you have any questions for our uh, experts here, and uh, we can raise them after this question. So I'm going to turn over to you now, Suchitra, and it's kind of like a follow up on to the comment that you made on Deepthi's question. Your work has looked at uh, theories of violence, war, and human nature. So you understand the multiple dimensions of conflict. So it'd be great if you could reflect upon how Kashmiri journalists and photographers like Masrat, you know, serve as interlocutors living through conflict and chronicling the continued siege of their home through photographs. And also how do they untangle their everyday existence while living under curfew? So I'm going to turn over to you now, Sitidra. I think the questions that you've raised is actually something that would be worthy of not one book, uh, hundreds of books to be written by Kashmiris. Um, and again, I, I, as, as an Indian, I, I feel uh, uncomfortable talking about uh, the Kashmiri experience, but I can talk about what the Indian state does um, in Kashmir. And I think um, as both Junaid and Deepthi have spoken about, all of the image making, all of the writing, all of the intellectual work, the scholarship, the journalism happens in a, in a, in a very peculiar and a very particular space. Um, this is not just, um, um, this is uh, one of the world's most militarized spaces. And uh, while we can go back to 30 years, um, there's a long history of violence and repression, um, a long history of um, denying people the right to not only choose their freedom, but also how to represent what kinds of freedom they want. In that scenario in which the very act of speaking, articulating, and even challenging the smallest of the, you know, the state existence, 
uh, can mean absolute death and disappearance. So this is how people have been writing. So in some ways, uh, while Article 370 and the revocation of that has made um, and the denial of the digital space has made things um, worse, I think we really have to, this is not a particular moment, this is not an exception. Um, what you really have to think about is a long history of what's happened um, and what thinking itself is created. So I think that is one thing that we have to be absolutely clear, that a militarized space with violence is not to be compared with any other space. It's completely different. And military occupation creates these structural conditions. Um, now coming to the journalists and writers and scholarship that is produced in Kashmir is that the immense valor and resilience that comes out of it. Um, there are stories of people, um, especially after 370, um, you know, changing, um, you know, uh, disk spaces going around, people trying to get information, um, but also they're still managing to produce work. Um, again, um, there's Asif, the case of Asif Sultan, even Masrath has been slapped with the UAPA. Uh, again, everyone knows the UAPA is a draconian law, but UAPA is only one of the many within the architecture of impunity. So I think those are things that we have to clearly understand. Um, so what does it mean to write write and think and memorialize and document under these conditions. Uh, first thing, it means that one, disappearance, because that's something that has happened to a lot of Kashmiris. Second is legal repercussions, but also the physical violence that can happen to you. And yet, despite these conditions, you still see Kashmiris, um, Kashmiris are not um, voiceless. They are not, unlike others, they are people who can, they are, they are very eloquent um, advocates and are articulate about their condition. The problem now is that it's difficult to hear the scream because that's what the Indian state has done for the last um, 30, 40, 60, 70 years to silence those voices. And what do we know that under these circumstances, producing work is immensely difficult. Journalism is immensely difficult. Um, photographing and creating work like Masrat and other young women and young photographers too is difficult. So I think that is how I would think about um, the work that is being produced in Kashmir right now. Thank you so much, Suchitra. I think that's a uh, very important, uh, those are very important points that you just brought up. And I want Deepthi and Junaid also to weigh in on uh, the question, you know, journalists and photographers serving as interlocutors. So uh, please, please feel free to share your comments on this. Sinead, you're welcome to jump in. You can go ahead and I'll come after you. Well, I, I really, I think Suchitra's um, sort of response is quite comprehensive. I don't have much to add to that. Um, I think, um, you know, I think like one of the things that comes to mind for me is, um, you know, with, with regard to the example that I was sharing earlier with the sports minister who um, you know, shared this image of the burqa clad woman uh, that equated her with uh, a caged woman and then sort of invoked, um, you know, a Kashmiri woman while, while looking at that image and talking about that image. Uh, and the thing that he said specifically was, Pinjara Taur ke hamari betiyan bahar nikli hai. Um, and, you know, what is, what is sort of ironic about the kind of, um, you know, sort of suppression of, of dissent and speech is like, you know, the Pinjara Taur is, is the sort of like, name of uh, an Indian women's activist group. Um, and recently, um, two of the women from that activist group were um, arrested, were taken, in, taken into custody um, for protesting, um, you know, the Indian government's um, new sort of, um, you know, citizen, citizenship laws um, that they have been sort of implementing. So um, the, the anti-CAA protests. Um, and so, you know, and, and at least one of them, I believe, was booked under the same act, the UAPA, that Masrat was booked under. Um, and so I think that that is also interesting for us to think about is that when, um, you know, when on, on the one hand, you have uh, this sort of like agent of the state um, referring to Pinjara Thor as this sort of like almost a, a, a kind of feminist sounding discourse of women's empowerment on the one hand. Um, but, but we know that the, the, the same state has actually targeted women who are active in that, in that feminist movement, Indian women. Um, and so, you know, perhaps one of the things that we can also think about is the, the way in which these kinds of moments um, open up. Um, 
uh, a possibility for Indian women to articulate real solidarity with Kashmiri women rather than a kind of appropriative solidarity that takes Kashmiri women to be part of like the Indian nation state. And so, you know, part of what I have argued and what I will argue is that, you know, to continue on that question of like the role that women play, I think um, Indian women can play a role um, in deflecting the idea that uh, Kashmiri women's biggest oppressors are Kashmiri men. Not that they're not, but they're not necessarily the only or the biggest ones, um, but also that they must cast, actually recast their solidarity with Kashmiri women as, as a transnational gesture, acknowledging that, um, you know, Kashmiri women do not want to be counted um, as, as part of Indian womanhood. Um, and so that's just some, you know, broad reflections um, bouncing off of Suchitra's thoughts. Thank you, Aditi. Um, so I just quickly want to also emphasize that um, Kashmir, of course, uh, every conflict that's going on in the world is unique in its own way, but it's also um, interconnected with all the historical struggles that have been going on. And it's important for us to make those connections. Um, these laws, UAPA, Public Safety Act, um, or Armed Force Special Powers Act, which has been in place in Kashmir since 1990, they were colonial laws that British had imposed on uh, Indians um, during the colonial period. PSA, uh, Britain had imposed during the apartheid regime in South Africa, you know, uh, or if we have been going through this um, uh, sustained process of curfews in Kashmir, where people are issued curfew passes. And um, uh, we are based, many of us are based in the US. And like, I, when I read the history of racism in the US, when I read the history of um, colonial um, repression of the Native Americans in the US, it just reminds me of our condition in Kashmir in the present. Um, I, I think that if we connect these dots, it will be, uh, you know, we'll be able to express our solidarity in a much more informed way. We will instinctively know what's going on with Kashmir uh, has happened already in other places and to be able to establish what kind of solidarities are, are required and why uh, voices like Masrats and other people who are working in Kashmir are, are so important and why do they speak to us in, in um, such uncanny uh, way? So I think that's just like something that comes to me, to my mind from what Suchitra had said earlier as well. Thank you so much uh, to all our experts for weighing in on this question and for all the wonderful thoughts that you've laid out throughout. So we are now uh, well around 9.25. So we'll just give some more space to uh, the audience Q&A and we have some great questions pouring in. So there's one for uh, Masrat if she is uh, happy to answer. It's by, yeah, it, Master, this is by Jill Shah. And the question is, how do the subjects of photographs react to you? How do you keep calm in the face of police violence and intimidation? And what advice do you have for young photojournalists? So uh, Master, uh, this will be great. I mean, it would be great if you could answer that for Jill Shah. And then I would really like to hear our experts' uh, perspectives on that question as well. Um, as I told in my speech that uh, I am, uh, I have grew up in the devastating consequences of conflict. So as a Kashmiri, I am used to these things. I have witnessed these situations every day. Uh, right now, I got a, uh, this WhatsApp message in my phone that an advocate uh, in my neighborhood is shot dead. So I just want to leave this conversation here and I want to go there and take the pictures. So that's a situation where we live in. So these situation made us like this. I am so sorry to hear that, uh, Master. This, this is just uh, the life seems to be, unfortunately, uh, in Kashmir. And uh, condolences uh, to uh, your colleague. But our experts, do you have anything to add, you know, just on the point of any advice for young journalists, young photojournalists, please feel free to share. Okay, so should I, I just move to the next question, I think, on this note. Okay, this question, 
so to throw out come to you um, by Praveen. So the question is, with the steps taken by the Indian regime, a textbook copy of steps taken by Israeli aggression against Palestine, with no solution in sight there, need to be more international pressure to Kashmir's cause. What is the way ahead for this? So Chitra, what do you think is the way ahead? Um, well, I think one of the things, I think, um, the, one of the, the silver lining, if one might say, since 370 has been, uh, the way the narrative on the front pages of, uh, at least briefly for the front pages of New York Times and Washington Post, uh, you increasingly see uh, more Kashmiri women writing and articulating. Um, um, it's the sense of consistent pressure. I think that is something has changed and I think it's great. You have um, organizations like Stand with Kashmir who now uh, are again working together with others on the ground to put out information. Having said that, I think the real way forward is to with at least, I, I can only speak as an Indian, I think is to demand um, for um, the absolute demilitarization of the region. Um, second is to use language with moral and political clarity. I know so many well-meaning liberals in India who would talk about uh, Kashmir as a human rights issue, but always refusing to make that important step that it's not just a human rights issue. It's a question of the fact that Kashmiris have been denied the right to choose their freedom, what kind of freedom they want. Um, the second thing that I would say uh, for a lot of Indians is our job is to stand in absolute solidarity. Our job is to unilaterally say that it's, it's the Kashmiri right for these demands, but never tell Kashmiris what they should, that right should entail. Uh, it is for them to decide. And I think those are some of the fundamental first steps that as Indians that we can take. Um, I think the second thing is um, the steps forward, I think for me is always about demilitarization, internationalize the issue, but more importantly, go back to Kashmiris and ask them what they need. And often um, in spaces, it's the Kashmiri voice that gets silenced first. And I think those are the things that are, um, what I would say are the things that we can do. Um, and again, as I said before, stand in absolute moral and political solidarity uh, with the Kashmiris and their um, fight for freedom. Thank you, Suchitra. Um, Deepthi, Junaid, I would also want you to just comment briefly on what is the way ahead, what's the road ahead uh, on the way forward for Kashmir, which is also a part of our conversation, our broader panel discussion today. Okay. Um, so, I mean, first, understanding what is going on in Kashmir is really important. Um, there has been a systematic attempt by um, the Indian government to uh, confuse uh, people around the world, um, use this bogey of Islamophobia to suggest that Kashmir is some kind of like a, a Islamist struggle to create, um, you know, IS type situation. Um, it is not. I mean, it erases our history. Uh, it erases our aspirations. It erases um, the long struggles that um, Kashmiri people have led. I mean, Kashmir is a diverse place. <clears throat> Although we are only uh, 10 million people, 10, 11 million people, but um, Kashmir uh, is a place for uh, multiple political aspirations. We had some of the most <laughs> socialist uh, the principles in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, uh, you know, we put in place land reforms and all of that. And um, some of the earliest ideas of emancipation, women's emancipation across South Asia were being discussed in Kashmir at that time. So we need to remember that um, that occupation uh, is, um, is a, it's not like <clears throat> somehow automatically uh, creating the situation. It's a deliberate attempt to uh, confuse people about Kashmir. And so we need to keep um, our eyes open, our ears open, try to connect our struggles with the struggles in Kashmir and to build real solidarities. And I um, want to echo what Suchitra said about Stand with Kashmir. Over the last um, year, we've been building uh, organic ties with struggles here in the US and elsewhere in the world. And that's the way, way ahead. I, I, um, unfortunately, I despair that um, the current regimes in power across the world are not going to help us. You know, they are, um, the, the commercial interests that they have, the geopolitical interests that they have, um, will not allow 
um, Kashmiri voices and Kashmiri aspirations uh, to be heard. So the struggles, the solidarity has to be expressed in terms of political and social movements. Thank you so much, Junaid. I think the, the idea of solidarity itself, no matter what the cause is, is very important, uh, regardless of where the conflict is. And in looking at today's world, more so even in the United States and elsewhere in the world. But uh, Masrud, you are the star of the show. So we have an exciting question for you from uh, Tomoso Day. And it is, what was the most challenging photograph in your career? So a little bit background story, if you could share. I think uh, that's an exciting question to answer. I mean, a difficult one, I'm sure, because uh, you're such a brave woman to be in such circumstances. So much uh, So I remember in 2017, uh, there was a civilian killing in the southern part of Kashmir. So it was my first, uh, like, first kind of that assignment to went to any, uh, like, uh, anyone's home to document the aftermath math of the killing. So I went there, I saw the, there, was a, there was a room, uh, like there was a lady who was leaning towards the wall and she was staring uh, towards the window. Uh, we came inside and uh, there were so many questions in my mind that what will happen, how will I approach, like did she, will she talk, like how will people react, they will see a, a Kashmiri girl, uh, like covering her head with the camera, how will they react? So there were so many questions. If security persons will stop me, uh, how will I answer? Like so many things were going on in my head. So like I entered the room with uh, my colleagues uh, and we sat down. She didn't uh, like uh, realize this thing that we are in that room. So uh, the lady was leaning behind the wall and uh, there was, another lady came inside the room and she said that she is the widow of the civilian. And I was like, okay. So that day she entered her uh, ninth month of pregnancy. So I was like, how she is going to take care of that uh, kid? So in uh, like, uh, in uh, uh, in couple of minutes, a little girl entered the room. She was uh, one and a half year old. So then I asked like, who is she? And uh, that uh, lady answered that she is the daughter of that civilian who was killed. And I was puzzled, like how she is going to take care of these two children. So like, I was unable to like, uh, think like how I will take out my camera from my bag, how I will take the pictures. Then I decided to move out uh, of that uh, room and I thought like I will make pictures in another room. I will talk to her, his uh, mother and father. So I uh, went there and when I, uh, when I was coming back, uh, uh, when I was coming back towards her, like there was the uh, hall was, of, the room was full of the like uh, ladies who were coming from neighbors for the solidarity and all. Like she was giving uh, the photograph of uh, uh, her husband and when she saw the picture of her husband and she started crying and everyone in the room started crying. Like I was like, now what will I do? Shall I like uh, put out my uh, camera from my bag? Shall I take the picture of this lady or not? Like it will be like, it will be like, uh, it will be, it will not look good if I will take the pictures of her miseries and all. So then, uh, then I thought, no, this is my job. I have to tell her story to the world, like what's happening in Kashmir. So I have to become her wise. I took the camera and I was, I was uh, like, uh, I was uh, trying to look through the viewfinder and I was unable to uh, see because uh, my eyes were full of tears and through the tears in my eyes, I clicked those pictures. So there's the uh, uh, most, uh, important picture for me that picture that was the first picture which uh, like uh, that is with me and that Matthew, picture will always remain with me Matthew, you can't even imagine the pain that uh, you would have gone through while you know taking this photograph and how brave of you to while emotionally going through this 
feeling this pain for the lady and the family you wanted to bring her voice to the fore you wanted to show that picture to the world and that's exactly why we are celebrating your work today because through your photographs through your incredible journey you have enabled um, sort of a developed the communication link between kashmir and the rest of the world and the life that people are leading there and it's 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 a challenge it's difficult and kudos salutations and all um, everything uh, that we could offer and at speak for everyone i guess we are so proud of you so proud of you so on this note um, i just want to m mention that while um, in the chat function we have questions we also have a lot of comments that are all uh, uh, towards you master congratulating you and celebrating you so our audience is really happy to have you on board so uh we are close to time now so i'm just going to take this opportunity to wrap up our event for today our ceremony the panel discussion uh, by thanking everyone who joined us thank you to all the speakers thank you to all the fantastic panelists and our amazing audience who made the conversation all the more engaging and congratulations again masrat thank you so much for sticking through this through such difficult circumstances be well everyone stay safe and please keep in touch Thank you again. Goodbye.